we have to make sure that the soil is put in well so if anyone builds a building on top of it, it won't settle. That's the primary goal. I like to get together with the superintendent before the concrete slab is placed and clearly identify where the control joints are going to be put. Normally they're shown on the drawings. If not, they may be specified at a certain spacing. Well, it's very important to have a, 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 a technical engineer out here to tech, check the concrete, to check the stability of the concrete because, you know, you're building these stories 11 stories high, 12 stories high. I per perform slump tests, air tests, unit weight tests. I make sure all the concrete, when it arrives on the job, has a proper slump. If not, um, bring it up to the proper slump. If it's over slumped, I reject it and send it back to the plant. I inspect all phases of the job, you know, dirt work, uh, excavations. Basically, uh, we're on the job site to ensure that the uh, contractor builds the uh, project as we designed it, or as close to compliance with the contract documents uh, as we can. Like the inspectors we've just seen, as an inspector for a state highway authority, a contractor, or even if you're a field engineer, you play a vital role in quality concrete. Up until now, perhaps you thought that quality concrete was all about the materials. Maybe you felt it relied on the right design or proper finishing. Well, quality concrete does require all of these, but it also takes the work of inspectors like we've just seen for quality assurance along the way. Today in this video, you're going to see the importance of your role as the inspector. We'll focus on pre-placement inspections, including subgrade inspections and the steps necessary for subgrade preparation. We'll examine inspection of formwork with its installation and adjustments. We'll highlight reinforcement inspections, showing size, grade, length, and placement of rebar. And finally, we'll cover your review of joint layout with the types and placement of joints. Now you may be asking, what's the point of inspections? Architects and engineers design a structure. They spell out their design and contract documents like the plans and specs. Your job, the one of inspection, is to check what's being built in the field against the information on contract documents. You and possibly several other inspectors on any given job may represent several different authorities and will have many different responsibilities. But the bottom line is, you're there to make sure that the owner, contractor, or local authority you represent gets what they pay for according to the plan, specs, and codes. With so many tasks, where do you start? If possible, go to a pre-construction meeting to identify the construction schedule and meet the key players you'll be dealing with. People like the owner's rep, the architect, engineer, general contractor, the ready-mix supplier, and concrete testing personnel. They like to get acquainted with you and uh, try and feel you out, see what kind of a person you are before you get out on a job site. But uh, as a rule, it's uh, pretty decent. You'll learn a lot here about who's doing what and when. I think listen carefully. Uh, make sure you're aware of what your roles and responsibilities are. We all have limits to what we're responsible for um, and what authority we have. Uh, make sure you know, again, who the superintendent is, who the key points of contact are with the owner, and uh, I'd be familiar, of course, as you can, uh, as familiar as possible with the plans and specs. Why is this information so important? because you'll be inspecting work done by all of the trades, including the excavating contractor, the formwork contractor, and even the reinforcing contractor. At this meeting, you're face to face with the people whose work you'll be inspecting, and so now's the time to open the lines of communication. A word of caution here, in the real world, you probably won't be the most popular person at this meeting. You see, you're kind of like a referee. You'll be checking to see that the game's played according to the rule book. Your rule book consists of plans, specs, and maybe even the codes. To some people at this meeting and on the job, your inspections may be viewed as slowing down the construction process. You're holding me up. That's what we hear. You're holding me up. I've got concrete coming. 
Uh, but again, it's, it's to his benefit to get it right as much, as much as it is the owner's benefit. Don't let it bother you that your enforcement of plans and specs may temporarily slow the construction process. Your job is just as important as the laborers who build a structure and engineers who design it because you're ensuring that what's being built meets the plans and specs. At the pre-construction meeting, make sure that everyone has up-to-date plans and specs in both the office and the field. When you do inspection on a construction site, you're basically looking to make sure that the contractors going by the new plans, the up-to-date plans, and the specifications which are all done by design engineers. Validating up-to-date plans at the meeting and in the field will help make sure that field crews are working off the most current set of plans. A lot of confusion and headaches can be prevented later because everyone knows what you'll accept or reject based on current plans. Now that you've been to the pre-construction meeting, where do you start in the field? Let's visit a few job sites you might be inspecting from commercial high-rises to roads from slabs on grade to bridges and even residential flat work. At these sites you'll be checking the subgrade, form work, reinforcement and joint layout. Almost every job will have some concrete placed on grade, so one of your first inspections covers the subgrade. A strong stable base is critical to support concrete and the loads it will carry. For concrete placed directly on the earth, check several things. The subgrade needs to be clean of debris and well compacted. Concrete can crack over soft spots that aren't adequately compacted or over boulders that haven't been removed. How do you know if the subgrade has been sufficiently compacted? How it was compacted is the first part of your answer. Large rollers work best to compact cohesive material like clay. Vibrating equipment works best on sand and gravel. Sometimes the people operating the equipment don't necessarily have expertise in the areas of soils. They know how to run their machines, but they don't necessarily know if the conditions are ideal or not. And people like me are out here to make sure that they use the right type of soil and that it's at the optimum moisture that it should be. And I'm trained to do that, so I generally know more than just the regular equipment operator who might be filling an area in. After compaction, be prepared to observe a proof roll. And with a proof roll, they'll use a, a big uh, a big truck, typically a double axle truck, um, whatever size is specified. And there you're looking to see if the ground is pumping ahead or behind the wheel. And that's a very good indication as to whether the subgrade is going to be acceptable. If you see pumping or rutting, that area must be recompacted. If after recompaction it's still soft, the underlying earth may have to be removed and replaced with a stronger fill material. The new fill material will have to be placed and compacted in lifts as specified by contract documents. Depending on the soil types in the site area, many jobs will require a granular fill to be placed and compacted over the already compacted earth. Once you've approved the proof roll, expect to be called later to inspect the granular fill for proper depth, compaction, and moisture content. The required compaction and moisture content will be in the job specs and can be measured by a nuclear moisture density gauge or sand cone. On the morning of concrete placement, you'll again need to visually inspect the subgrade for moisture content. A subgrade that's too dry will absorb water from the concrete mix, causing plastic shrinkage cracks. A surface with standing water will increase the water-cement ratio of the mix decreasing the concrete strength and durability. You may also have to inspect a subgrade covered with a plastic vapor barrier. This barrier helps to block water in certain soil types from migrating upward through the hardened concrete. This moisture can cause delamination of floor coverings. When inspecting a subgrade vapor barrier, be sure the plastic completely covers the subgrade, that the sheets overlap the required distance, and that the plastic has no holes in it.
Whether you're inspecting a residential sidewalk or a parking garage, concrete needs form work to hold it in place until it hardens. On the day of the proof roll inspection, you can take a look at the forms, but chances are they're not complete yet. Laborers are usually installing and adjusting forms right up until the day of placement. We'll uh, look for in form work, uh, make sure it's clean, make sure the surface is a good surface. It's not rough, it's not going to cause a bunch of pot marks or bug holes, give you a good finish. We want to see that the form work is plumb and that it's straight uh, that it, and it's located in the right spot. For now, review the specs to ensure the forms are being installed at the right elevation so the full depth or thickness of concrete is placed. Well, what I usually do is I, I have the contractor get a couple men and pull a string line across for me, and then I'll walk out there and I'll measure from the string line down to the subgrade to make sure that uh, we have, like you said, six inches or eight inches, a minimum of that. If it gets a little over, that's fine. Forms should also be coated with a release agent so that the concrete doesn't stick to the forms when they're removed. If you're inspecting elevated formwork for a high-rise or parking garage, you'll need to check a few more things on and below the deck. First, is the plywood clean and free of debris and concrete spillage from the previous placement? If not, have the contractor use a broom or compressed air to clean the plywood. Second, if the specs call for chamfer strips at beams and columns, are they in place? If not, Notify the formwork contractor now. Next, as you go below the deck, take a look at the formwork members, the runners, stringers, and shores. Correct spacing of these members is critical because this temporary structure will have to support the fresh concrete, the crew, and heavy equipment during installation. These combined loads actually weigh more than the intended loads on the finished structure. Remember, Bracing of the shores will also be required to prevent sideway movement during concrete placement. Now that you've completed the subgrade and formwork inspections, you probably feel like you're getting the hang of the job, right? Hold on for just a second. Just when you thought you had the inspection process down pat, there's another material that may complicate matters, reinforcing steel. Inspecting the subgrade and formwork is a lot harder when you're looking through a maze of rebar. If you're checking sidewalks and other types of residential flat work, it may be a bit easier. You generally won't have to worry as much about reinforcing here. But as structures carry more loads, such as roads, or commercial high-rises, reinforcing steel becomes more critical and complex. Reinforcement inspections require several things. First and most critical is the placement of rebar in the forms. Improper placement of rebar affects the strength of the structure. You see, concrete is strong in compression and weak in tension. We use steel and concrete to reinforce areas that are weak in tension. Therefore, it's critical to ensure rebar has been placed at the proper depth in the forms. When rebar sits higher or lower than it's supposed to, the concrete may not have the structural integrity it should. The proper depth and cover of the rebar will be listed on the plans. To inspect commercial slabs and beams which have multiple layers of rebar, you'll have to be on site to check each layer as it's installed. Next. During rebar placement, ask yourself if the right type of rebar is being installed. Rebar comes in different grades and sizes based on the tensile strength that's needed in the structure. The reinforcing drawings indicate what size, grade, and length rebar are to be used and where it's to be placed. You can check these in the field by looking at the markings on the rebar and measuring the length. No doubt some rebar will need to cross and be spliced together. Splicing rebar is a typical practice, especially if you have a very large slab, for example, that may be 100 feet long. Most of the rebar is going to come in sticks of 30 or 40 foot lengths, so you have to overlap them uh, the correct amount. The length of the lap is going to depend on the class of splice, on the bar size. The minimum lap distance will be shown on the plans, and reinforcing details can be easily checked with a tape measure. 
Be aware that wherever several laps occur, the plans may require more concrete cover. Check the depth at these critical locations. Finally, during rebar inspection, how clean is the steel? Dirty rebar prevents a good solid bond between concrete and steel. How much rust is too much? If it's a little rust, it's not going to hurt it. In fact, it's going to enhance the bond or mill scale, which is typical uh, that you see on rebar. But if it's rust and it's starting to flake off, which could, uh, which could detract from the bond, or if it's actually rusting so bad that it's making the bar smaller, actually going away, then you've got a problem that needs to be de dealt with. The slight mill scale shown here is acceptable and comes from transportation and storage on the job site. However, if there's excessive rust, dirt, or form oil on the rebar, notify the contractor before the concrete is placed. Since joints aren't put into place until concrete is placed, as an inspector, why would you have to worry about jointing during a pre-placement inspection? Simply because joints must be planned for well before the concrete sets up and starts cracking randomly. It's actually expected that concrete will crack. When concrete dries and hardens, the shrinkage and temperature changes cause stresses within the concrete. Concrete relieves these stresses by cracking. So joints are really just neat, controlled, anticipated cracks. There are three different types of joints. Contraction, isolation or expansion, and construction. Contraction joints are put in places we expect concrete to crack. They can be tooled while the concrete is wet or saw cut the very next day. Contraction joints are shown on the plans. Check to see if they've been marked in the field, possibly by the form.